two, 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 testing, testing, one, two, three, in the place to be. <laughs> yeah, you know it. Hey, look here. <laughs> My name is Cato, and uh, welcome <laughs> to Speak Easy tonight. All right, thank you. Um, I, uh, I want to, I want tonight, I want to tell you a story. Um, a story about basically the circle of inspiration and, and impact that goes on within the go-go uh, music culture. Um, there, uh, as you can tell from being here tonight, there are many, 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 many stories within go-go. And uh, this is just one of them, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, okay, we start off, basically, I grew up in an area where live band music was as prevalent as, as, as grilled cheese and toasted bread. I mean, every way you went, every neighborhood, just about every other neighborhood you went in, there were kids forming bands. You know, some, some neighbors had, neighborhoods had two, three, four bands or whatever like that. And everywhere you p went, there was always some kind of band playing somewhere, whether it was... Watts Playground or Anacostia Park or, or, or at a Boys and Girls Club in the neighborhood rec center and, you know, even in the backyard of, of somebody's home. There would always be a band playing, you know. So in that kind of atmosphere, how can a child not be inspired by something like that and want to do that? So that's exactly what happened with me. I wanted to do that. And I asked my dad to buy me a guitar. I wanted to play guitar, and I wanted to play like the bands in the neighborhood was playing. So I get my little guitar, and I'm practicing, and still, you know, doing my little homework that I'm supposed to do. And um, my older brother, uh, one night, now I had been seeing bands in different neighborhoods, but never been in a club or nothing. So around, um, right around 1979, I'm going to call this uh, around the time that the, a, a wave just started taking over the area, and this new wave was about uh, like a new style that bands were playing their music in. You know, it was something new. So it's 1979, and I'm 14 years old, and my brother takes me with him to the Club Laburn. And there are two bands playing up at the Club Laburn. One band is called Experience Unlimited, and another band is called Trouble Funk. <laughs> Both of them crank, both of them got down. And I was siced. I was siced like a mug. I'm saying, man, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That was, a, that was a big old joke. That joke was like, oh my goodness. I had never, I had, I had seen bands playing all the time, but this the way they was rolling that night was, was really powerful. And that was real tight. So, you know, a week later, just a week later, my brother again took me out this time to see a band called Red Essence. Now, if I was size a week before, <laughs> I was in awe when I saw Red Essence. I'm gonna tell you right now, these cats here, you know, and there were other bands on the cars, but not like the, these cats here, they were giving you something different. They were giving you a show. I mean, when they came on stage, you know, they were giving you a show from the, from the uniformity, all wearing red jumpsuits, to, you know, the choreography they would do on stage, you know what I'm saying, um, to the way they would vamp into songs and stuff, you know, it just not just play it, but they would vamp into it. Um, and even the way that they would, uh, even the way that they would have gimmicks in their music that really sliced the crowd up and got the crowd more involved in their music, such as little things like backing it up, little stuff like that but it always got the crowd size, okay? So there was this, out among the Red Essence band, there was one little tiny cat up on the stage, right? And he was a little kid, you know? He, he was you know, probably no more than a year or two older than me, and I'm 14 myself. But this little kid is so energetic and so dynamic and so powerful, so charismatic on stage that he got everybody loving him. You know what I'm saying? He had such a strong and powerful voice even back then. You know what I'm saying? So he was very dynamic and, you know, instantly became like a front man to that band Ray Essence. So, of course, 
I'm psyched about this band again. And I, um, you know, I, be, I basically become a fiend. I would go see this band all the time play, and I would get PA tapes of them, and I would, you know, when I would go see them play, like up at the Howard Theater or something, you know, everybody dancing, I'm up on the balcony just studying them, studying, you know, these guys, God, what, the way they do their things. You know, I'll grab my t uh, PA tapes of them and, and, you know, learn on stuff on my guitar, just study. I was a fiend. I was, put it this way, I walked around high school with a Red Essence notebook. <laughs> and to top it off, that book was so cool, it got me play, too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, you know, as, as time marches on, this little guy that I'm telling you about, I spoke about earlier, little Benny, I found out he leaves the band, Ray Essence, and he starts his own band. And now, I'm divided. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I still love Ray Essence, but now I love this new band called Lil Benny and the Masters. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, so now I'm still studying both. You know, I still, you know, go see Rassens, go see Lil Benny, go see Rassens, go see Lil Benny, study Rassens, study Benny, you know, do my homework with the stuff. And, you know, it'd be times I would go see Benny playing, um, you know, he would, uh, it would be times he would sometimes ask me, you know, where your guitar at? You know, and I would say, shoot my guitar out in the car, you know? Not necessarily, bringing my guitar to play with him, but basically me and my man Weeze would be coming from band practice and we would always stop there and watch, go see them play, you know. So anyway, time goes by, I'm still playing my little thing in the little bands and stuff. And one day I get a phone call, right? So phone call, so the guy voice on the other end said, uh, hello, can I speak to Kato? <laughs> I'm like, this Kato, he said, uh, What's up, Kato? This little Benny. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? First, I didn't believe it was Benny, you know. Then after I realized it was Benny, I, you know, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm telling my brother. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, I was thrown off because, you know, first of all, why would he be calling me? And second of all, how in the heck he get my number in the first place? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But he did. So he went on to say that he was making changes in his band, and he asked if I was interested in auditioning. What the hell you think? <laughs> I mean, for real, what do you think, huh? <laughs> of course, so here I am in a basement on 14th and Good Hope Road with the likes of people like Mark Godfather Lawson, DC, Marky, Jungle Boogie, Terry, Elmo, whole rack of folks that I looked up to from a distance and all. And now I'm in a basement sharing the love that we all have for this go-go music with these same cats. And, uh, and of course, Benny himself. <laughs> and uh, so I basically, you know, uh, played with Benny about six years in two different bands. One was called, of course, Little Benny and the Masses. Then it was a kind of a merge thing, and we became proper utensils. And uh, yeah, with the go-go rum shake and nah, 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 all that. That was Benny's voice too, nah, 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 nah. But any, anyway, um, so we were doing that thing, and we, was, we were enjoying life. That's six years, you know what I'm saying? We were enjoying life. We played all kinds of places, Panorama Room, Black Hole, Metro Club, East Side, Rhythms, triples, Ibex. We even got up the Capitol Center, you know what I'm saying? That was a big deal to get up to the Capitol Center, you know, and that was a big deal. And of course, you know, six years go by and all that, and we all get older now. We all enter in our late 20s and stuff. And life happens, you know. And I basically, I say that to say that I basically got married and left Gogo. -Go. <laughs> Started the family. <laughs> it happens, you know. You know, we do those kind of things when we're young. I'm not knocking it. I'm not knocking it, baby. <laughs> anyway, so I had left the go-go thing, you know, alone. But, you know, um, and I'm living the normal family life now. So two years into the, living the normal family life, and now and it's about 
1996, and I discovered something else, this new thing called the internet, right? <laughs> <laughs> you laugh now, but back then, if I'd have said that, y'all would have been like, the hell you talking about it? Email. <laughs> That's a circle with an A in it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, but, um, so, but it, was, it was, you know, I, I, I discovered it because of a job I was working at, but I was just so intrigued by that, that same kind of intriguingness that I wanted to know how to, how to build websites and stuff like that, you know? So, I, you know, obviously I'm going to learn and teach myself or take whatever class I can and learn how to do, build a website, but I had to have a subject to build it on. And, you know, the only thing that I know about for the past 10, 15 years is GoGo. So I basically built the site on that. And I based it on the name of a song made by Ray Essence during the time Benny was with him called Take Me Out to the GoGo. And, and I phrase, I called it Kato's, take me out to the go-go. You know what I'm saying? That's a long thing trying to get somebody to type in. So I said, I'm going to have to shorten this up. And I took the capital letters of all the words, take me out to the go-go, T-M-O-T-T-G-O-G-O dot com, t m o t go go And that's how that became the beat. So later on, you know, a little time later, a couple of years, decide, you know, me and some cats, my man Press, Big Press, Mark, my main man, and uh, Weez Richard, uh, we do this thing and we put out, decide to go into and make it a magazine, a hard copy. So the very first person I thought of to approach to going to be on the cover of this magazine was who? Lil Benny, my man. <laughs> not Chuck. Chuck been on the cover, but not the very first. <laughs> And so, you know, I hollered at Benny about doing it, and he was like, sure, you know. Benny, Benny was like that. Benny was a cat who, who oh, he basically supported anything I did, you know. He really did, you know, whenever we would have our little t uh cookouts or whatever, he would show up there, you know, anything had anything to do with the coalition. If they was doing photo shots and stuff, he would show up. You know, he was still doing his thing. While, um, um, you know, he, of course, he went on playing with Chuck and other ones other folks. And so um, he would even often ask me sometime, he used to say, uh, okay, are you still playing that guitar? And I'm like, man, and you know, my chops, he said, man, don't worry about it. All you, got, you can rap. All you need to do is chuck and you can rap. That's all you need to do. So little stuff like that. So anyway, you know, and that's kind of how things was for the past years. But um, oh, it was the morning of uh, May 30th, 2010. And uh, I had received a call that, you know, hit me like a ton of bricks. You know what I'm saying? It was a call from Ron Moe from the Peace of Horlicks, and he called to give me the news that Benny had died. And I'm like, what? You know, it's my man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he gone? You know? And um, <clears throat> the funeral was held at the convention center. Okay, now, you got to be really a big person in the city where they have to hold your funeral at the convention center. That just shows you how big Lil Benny was in the city, you know? And um, so, go to the, uh, so if, and I didn't want to sit up front. I'm not, I'm not a front sitting guy. I like to remember the cat. You know, when you see a person, I like to, when I think about them, I want to think about them the last time I seen them. You know, that's just a picture I want in my head. So I kind of sat, you know, over to the back. Is, and as I'm sitting over there, I'm uh, going through a, the, they hand me a, a program, a booklet, basically. A pictorial booklet, and it was this program, and it was basically photos of his entire life as a child all the way on up. And, um, you know, so they hand me the photo thing, and I'm sitting there. And as I'm turning the page, I get to a page, and my heart drops, and my eyes starts to water. And in that book was the picture of the magazine cover he did for me 12 years earlier. And that kind of like, you know, this is a book about his life. 
You know what I'm saying? And that was in there to me. That told me that, now here's a guy who I was inspired by before I started playing with him. Was inspired by while playing with him and still inspired after I stopped playing with him. And meaning he really played a role in my life. But me seeing this in there told me in some kind of way, apparently I played a role as well. Because if it was that important, when you put something in somebody's life and you put all the stuff they went through, that must have been a serious thing to him. I know he would say it sometimes, but to see it that way, you know, it's, it, it must have been a big thing to him and his family, you know. So, like I said, we all have millions and millions of stories, and that was just one of them. But that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you.